Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to open the meeting for economic development on assessing economic impact on Freight New York City initiative today here at 1 o'clock. Uh, at some point, we're going to get a quorum, and we're going to, wherever we are in the meeting at that point, we're going to take a quick break, vote on the resolution, and then we'll go right back into the hearing. We're almost there, um, trying to work with all the council member schedules. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our EDC committee on New York City Council. Today is Thursday, October 18th, 2018. I'm Council Member Vallone, and I have the privilege of chairing today's hearing. I'd like to extend my thanks to the committee members and the administration for coming together on today's hearing. The purpose today is to discuss the components of the EDC's $100 million Freight New York City Initiative, a program designed to modernize the city freight system and shift a significant portion of the freight distribution from predominantly trucking, trucking to maritime and rail systems. The goal of the Freight NYC program is to alleviate these concerns by modernizing the city's outdated maritime, rail, and aviation-based freight infrastructure, much of which is over 100 years old and improving the so-called last mile logistics for consumer deliveries in its burgeoning e-commerce industry. Nearly 90% of the city's freight is transported via truck today. The Economic Development Corporation estimates that total freight volume will increase by 68% between 2012 and 2045, and total truck trips from New York City to Long Island are expected to increase by an astounding 85% during that time, much of which is expected to go through the Lincoln Tunnel and the George Washington Bridge. The freight initiative is designed to get ahead of those anticipated increases in freight traffic by driving freight businesses to the city's maritime, rail, and aviation hubs over the next few decades, rather than continuing on uh, lending on the truck goods around the region. The four primary goals of the freight initiative are to create 5,000 good paying jobs, transform how freight enters the city, modernize and develop new freight distribution facilities, and improve air quality uh, in New York City. With a $100 million investment into these programs, we in the committee do not doubt these goals can be met over the te next 10 years. However, we have concerns over the details of the initiative respect to the funding, the site selection for the new distribution centers, the prioritization of the infrastructure investments, and the updates have they been made to the existing facilities. The committee would like to discuss whether EDC or the administration is taking steps to ensure these in infrastructure investments do not increase the cost of doing business in the city, the changes in freight logistics from trucking to maritime or rail could impact the bottom lines for local businesses. We on the committee applaud the EDC for taking the lead on the initiative, and we look forward to learning more about the logistics of the program in the course of today's hearing. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're joined today by Councilmember Adams, Ku, Rosenthal, and Powers. Um, I'd also like to thank the EDC staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Emily Forgione, and Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali for their hard work putting this hearing together. Um, I also mentioned about our resolution. Let me just give a quick summary of what's going on. Um, today we'll be voting on a, a proposed resolution number 178-A, sponsored by myself and fellow Queens Council Member Costa Constantinides, calling upon the Federal Aviation Administration to amend the North Shore helicopter route to extend further west to cover portions of Northeast Queens that are currently not covered. The timing of this resolution could not be any better as we have just announced, in partnership with the FAA and Congressman Tom Swasey, a new pilot program that will test alternative inbound routes and diversify flight paths for the helicopters coming in and out of New York City. The communities of Bayside, Whitestone, College Point, uh, and Astoria have dealt with the onslaught of helicopter noise for far too long. This resolution, a new pilot program, will bring immediate relief and improved safety. Um, a win that I want to thank my fellow council members for their previous work here in Manhattan on tackling the helicopter industry. And I thank that. It will be a great increase of the quality of life for the families of Northeast Queens. Um, I think at this point I'd like to turn over who's going to testify today for the EDC. We have uh, Ryan White and Charles Will Fisher. So I think we'll, Alex, you want to swear them in? Would you both please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great. Good Thank answer. You. <laughs> you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Vallone and members of the Economic Development Committee. My name is Ryan White, and I serve as the Director of Freight Initiatives for NYC EDC's Ports and Transportation Department. I am joined on the panel by my colleague, Will Fisher, uh, senior Project Manager, uh, Government and Community Relations. 
Uh, we look forward to answering your questions you may have about your, our exciting new program following this testimony. In June of 2017, Mayor de Blasio released a comprehensive vision for creating 100,000 new jobs over the coming decade. This plan, called New York Works, included a roadmap for substantial investment in freight distribution. Simply put, without a sound freight system, New York stops running. The efficient and re reliable distribution of goods uh, is both foundational to the city's economy and inextricably linked to the safety and security of New York's residents, workers, and visitors. Each day, freight is, moved, is used to move food, clothing, and general consumer goods through supply chains throughout the city. If these supply chains were to fail, New York City would grind to a halt. Our supermarket shelves would be empty, our gas stations would have no fuel, and our hospitals would not have the medical supplies they need to save lives. For too long, New York has relied on 20th century uh, freight transportation models. Freight NYC is the solution we need by bringing these critical systems into the 21st century. It would be hard to overstate the importance of trade in New York. The greater New York region has a gross metropolitan product of $1.5 trillion. This makes us the largest consumer market in the United States, and our economy is equivalent to the gross domestic product of Australia. But as mentioned, the greater region's uh, 20 million residents are relying on a freight model not designed for our modern needs. The current system is a product of investments made in the 1950s, which created the interstate highway system, thereby contributing to urban sprawl and the development of vast acres of land developed solely for urban distribution in our neighboring New Jersey. During this time, there was a shift away from moving goods by water to piers in Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Staten Island, and towards an increased reliance on trucking goods into the city from surrounding states. In addition to increased use of the interstate highway system, the invention of containerization, or the bundling of freight into truck-sized metal containers, uh, was game-changing for the industry. By dramatically reducing the cost of shipping, containerization permanently transformed international commerce. For New York City, this meant that the old water-based freight system, which barged goods to piers, uh, became increasingly obsolete. The steady decline of, movement, of moving goods by water continued through, uh, through the 60s and 70s as freight shipping lines moved out of New York and into larger container terminals in uh, New Jersey. From here, freight was then delivered by trucks via the interstate network connecting New York and New Jersey. This is still New York's main mode of transporting goods today. When creating Freight NYC, one of our key findings was that trucks are responsible for carrying 90% of the freight entering, leaving, and traveling through the city. While our freight system is fraying, New York City's population is growing. By 2040, the city is expected to be home to more than 8.6 million residents. And these residents are increasingly demanding more goods that are delivered faster and at cheaper prices. That's why at EDC, we say freight don't wait. But today, this increased demand is incompatible with worsening roadway congestion uh, and limited investments in highway infrastructure. One critical artery, the George Washington Bridge, which was first opened in 1931 and connects New Jersey and northern Manhattan, handles 30,000 trucks per day, or 55% of all trucks crossing the Hudson into New York City. From a resiliency and redundancy and security standpoint, we have no choice but to use other modes of transportation to move current and future goods into the city. To address all of these challenges, EDC developed Freight NYC, an ambitious plan to move fewer goods by trucks, better utilize our waterways and rail lines, and modernize our distribution facilities. In the process, the initiative will create roughly 5,000 good-paying jobs for New Yorkers of all backgrounds. These jobs, which will be created over the coming decade, will offer a ladder into the middle class. The rail jobs created will pay an average of $60,000 per year. The maritime jobs will pay over $62,000 per year and the distribution jobs will pay roughly $50,000 per year. We plan to work with the unions on the, these job opportunities, which will be created through the release of RFPs, as well as partnerships with other stakeholders. The Freight NYC plan includes four strategies to modernize and optimize the freight system in New York City, including making investments in maritime infrastructure, rail infrastructure, modern distribution space, and clean trucks. I'll now go into detail in our plan uh, in each of these categories. 
First, I'll talk about Fred NYC's maritime investments. As some of you may know, New York was first settled by the Dutch because of its strategically located harbor, and this advantage continues today. Global shipping companies still make New York their first port of call because of the sheer size of our consumer market. While the shipping business considers New York region as one unified marketplace, the final transport of goods from New Jersey ports to New York City consumers and businesses is more complicated. When goods arrive from global shipping companies, they are then put onto trucks, which often get stuck in traffic trying to leave New York Harbor. This slows the supply chain and makes our harbor far less competitive than it should be. Efficiently moving goods from a ship to its final destination is the most important metric of success and one that needs to be improved. That is why Fred NYC calls for a shift in how we move freight from a truck dependent model to a hub and spoke model where goods are immediately placed on a barge once they arrive in New York Harbor. These goods are then shipped to ports in neighboring New England and mid-Atlantic states. The new barge service leverages our marine highways, a coastal service promoted by the US Department of Transportation's uh, American Marine Highway Program, which runs parallel to highways like the Interstate 95. This approach allows shipping containers or even palletized cargo, which is essentially bagged cargo or anything on wooden pallets, to move from large regional container terminals to various points uh, in the city on barges via our waterways, thereby reducing roadway congestion and pollution. New York City will assist in developing the facilities needed to support increased barging in our harbor. In addition to barging infrastructure improvements, we recently announced the creation of a regional barge council, the North Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance. This new alliance includes representatives from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, other regional port authorities, maritime terminal operators, public agencies, and service providers. The major goal of the alliance is to reduce truck traffic locally and regionally so that fewer trucks are driving along Interstate 95, including the Cross Bronx Expressway and elsewhere. We know that freight moving in trucks along that corridor could and should be moved off of the highway and put onto barges. We will also work with the newly formed alliance to promote the regular maintenance dredging of New York City's waterways, including Newtown Creek, Flushing Bay, and East Chester Creek in the Bronx. Barges need adequate water depths to operate, thus the need to regularly remove the sediment and debris on the bottom of the waterway that may prevent that activity in the first place. Now I'd like to discuss Fred NYC's vision for improving rail freight. Highway congestion, infrastructure costs, and air pollution concerns have all made rail freight competitive again. To take advantage of this opportunity, New York City will support the modernization and expansion of rail freight facilities where shipments are moved from rail cars to last mile trucks. This process of moving goods from a rail car into a smaller truck is known as transloading. The city will assist in developing new track connections known as rail spurs to better connect industrial and food related businesses, particularly in Brooklyn and Queens, to the national rail network, eliminating thousands of truck miles in the city each year. This plan also supports the Port Authority's Cross Harbor Freight Program, which aims to reduce truck traffic into New York City from New Jersey through rail and maritime investments. Additionally, it supports the Metropolitan Rail Freight Council, a unique and effective group that looks for solutions to improve rail freight service in our region. In 2017, MRFC released an action plan with goals to increase rail freight service to locations east of the Hudson River, support industrial jobs, and promote environmental sustainability. The third vision calls for the, for the development of what uh, Freight NYC calls freight hubs. These freight hubs will be modern distribution centers in existing industrial areas that are ripe for enhancement, connected to maritime and rail infrastructure, and will feature hundreds of new jobs, including material handlers, logistics coordinators, and warehouse associates. Today, New York City is home to smaller, outdated facilities that do not meet current needs. To prepare for our growing population and increased consumer and business demand, we need to develop new space in existing industrial areas where multiple forms of transportation, including rail, maritime, and highway, support urban distribution and manufacturing businesses. This includes neighborhoods like Sunset Park, Brooklyn, where the first RFP to identify a developer to construct the first freight hub was released in August of 2018. 
Other locations include Hunts Point in the Bronx, the, the northwest shore of Staten Island, and the Maspeth area of Queens. All of these places already see industrial activity. Freight hubs will also host support facilities such as off-street truck plazas and alternative fueling stations. The city will assist in making strategic, strategic investments in freight hubs that meet our current freight demand while accommodating e-commerce and economic growth and making New York City more resilient against supply chain disruption. This vision relies on other maritime rail and clean truck visions described. Another one of Freight NYC's key strategies is promoting the adoption and use of clean trucks, which are the last step in the supply chain. Today, most trucks still rely on fossil fuels to deliver goods to residents and businesses, yet we know these fuels are bad for the environment. Moving forward, New York City must encourage the development of cutting edge and emission free trucks. Our ultimate goal is to have all New York City trucks, truck deliveries powered by clean energy. Through its contracting and lease agreements, the city will call for the adoption of clean fleets for tenants more aggressively. Additionally, the city will identify new locations for alternative fueling, particularly near or, sur or surrounding our freight hubs, to signal to the private sector that New York City is committed to improving air quality. These actions will keep our air cleaner, positively change the city's transportation network, and help achieve the city's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. Implementing the full suite of Fred NYC proposals is ambitious. However, these are actions we must take to keep New York the global capital of commerce it is today. By transforming critical freight and distribution networks, modernizing distribution spaces, improving air quality, and creating at least 5,000 good paying jobs for New York City residents, we are improving the city's quality of life and safeguarding its economic future. With Freight NYC, the greatest city in the world will soon have the freight distribution channels it needs to thrive. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, gentlemen. Before we jump into the questions, uh, we have formed a quorum. We've been joined by council members Cornegie, Barron, and Richards. So at this point, based on our proposed resolution, resolution 178A, which is calling on a resolution, it's a resolution calling on the Federal Aviation Administration to amend the North Shore helicopter route to extend further west to cover Northeast Queens. If we could take a roll call on that resolution, please. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on economic development. Chair Vallone. Aye. Barron. I vote aye. Cornegie. Aye. Koo. Aye. Richards. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Adams. Aye. Powers. Aye. A vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Resolution has been adopted by the committee. Thank you, everyone. And if we could keep the roll call open for the duration of the hearing, that would be great. Um, I know some of the council members have subsequent hearings, so if anyone wanted to ask, I know Council Member Powers and Richards both have quick questions, so I'd like to. It's on freight, or what is it? This is on the freight. So we'll start with Council Member Powers. Sure, thank you. Appreciate we'll letting let you me go. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to leave early. Um, I want to talk about the there was an, you know, the new Amazon Center that's coming to Staten Island, um, and I wanted to ask uh, just starting questions, any any sort of coordination or interaction between this program and the uh, and anticipated Amazon uh, distribution center in Staten Island? Because you also talked about some, some centers in, uh, in Staten Island and the North Shore. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for that question about uh, sort of e-commerce and Amazon on Staten Island. Um, the focus of this plan has been on developing freight hubs across the city and geographically uh, dispersed locations. Um, in terms of the, the Amazon uh, development on Staten Island, um, that is largely a private development. Um, there are publicly owned sites nearby that we do play a larger role in, uh, including the Global Container Terminal, um, as well as the Arlington Rail Yard. Um, and those are the facilities you know, we have been um, thinking about enhancing as well. Um, we know that e-commerce is, of course, disrupting uh, sort of consumer behavior. Um, and uh, you know, through this plan, we'll certainly want to uh, accommodate that change in consumer habits. Uh, but, but you know, a lot of the focus of this plan has been on supporting industrial businesses and industrial areas, uh, as well as consumers. 
And uh, council member, uh, I will also add that for, uh, for that particular development, we've been working in partnership with uh, New York City DOT, as well as the borough president's office and the council members, uh, Matteo and Rose on Staten Island to uh, make some um, uh, roadway intersection improvements nearby that site, recognizing that there will be additional truck traffic. And it will be all trucks, no freight, is that correct? But Amazon, how Amazon will be uh, shipping? Right. All That's uh, correct. Uh, so they're, they're, not part, they're not part of this plan here today. They're doing a private development with a lot of trucks. Do we know how many trucks they're going to be using? So at this time, I'm unable to comment. I think we could try to find that out for you. There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's following it's up on that, is there any collaboration between the, the public sites that we own versus the Amazon private owned site? Is there any working together to figure out that tr freight distribution? From my understanding, the, those, uh, in, uh, those entities have been speaking, but I, I don't know where those conversations have gone uh, at this point, but uh, we can certainly try to uh, figure that out. Yeah, I would think on the impact of commercial truck traffic when you have a site like Amazon and Staten Island and the growth of e-commerce, I think it's something that we need to have a, a larger role in the planning of that distribution from those sites and, and linking it into this freight plan and maritime plan because to, op to operate separate of each other's goals, we're just going to create further chaos. So. Yeah, just one last question. Just right. was there any, I know the state had put money, I think, money into the, the new development for Amazon, the fulfillment center. Had there been any sort of coordination between the city, EDC, and the New York State uh, Economic Development Corporation when it comes to, or by state development, when it comes to uh, that center? or that new fulfillment center? Uh, I, I am not sure of that at this moment. Uh, as I mentioned, we can certainly try to find that out for you to see if there was uh, coordination with the yeah. city. And, and just, sorry, one last question. Sure. I'm, I'm, I sound like Columbo. Uh, but one last question. The, uh, the jobs that you're anticipating, 5,000 new jobs as a result of Freight NYC, presumably those are going to replace some existing jobs that are happening because of trucking or other or other ways that you're where we're moving uh, goods around today. Have you done any number to so any study to show how many of new jobs are created by that versus replacement jobs? Are, are those five thousand? What does that five thousand represent in terms of cumulative new jobs? Right, net new jobs. Will do you want to answer? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the 5,000 jobs that are projected here are cumulative new jobs. I think, um, you know, we, we know that trucking is always going to be a part of the supply chain, even if we're able to uh, divert some of the earlier portions of the supply chain to maritime and to rail mode. So we know that trucking will always be a part of it, and, you know, those good local truck jobs are, are going to stay. You know, the, the jobs that we're talking about here, the, the 5,000, they come from a, a variety of places, but including the uh, maritime investments, the rail investments, and the, the freight hub. So these are both, um, you know, directly working at these maritime and rail terminals that we're talking about, um, and also at some of the distribution facilities that we are um, going to be developing on city-owned sites. And then the last thing I would add is that <coughs> um, EDC includes robust language that we refer to as higher NYC, which requires uh, when there are developments on city-owned parcels that we're working with, we require the developers to source those jobs locally and work with a local work workforce partner such as a uh, SBS Workforce One Center or, or another partner to ensure that the, uh, the residents living in that neighborhood get kind of the first cut at those jobs. How do we do that? That's a great question. With Council Member, how, how do we ensure that the local jobs are, are kept here? What's the next step? So if it's part of the requirement, how do we know that those companies are actually doing that? Yeah, so, um, you know, EDC takes, this, takes the, the, the local hire portion of this very seriously. You know, this is uh, folding into the mayor's jobs plan. This is, you know, a, this is at, at its very core a, a, a jobs proposal here, this Freight NYC. So um, the hire NYC language that's included, like I said, um, requires the developers to, one, advertise the jobs first locally so that um, the, the local neighborhood gets the, kind of the first cut and to work with a local workforce partner. So, um, uh, you know, this kind of depends where, they're, um, where they are throughout the city, but I'll give an example of Sunset Park. So in Sunset Park, um, the local workforce partner is operated by Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Um, they actually are housed at Brooklyn Army Terminal where SBS does a lot of work, or excuse me, where EDC does a lot of work. Um, so they, they kind of have a uh, list of candidates already for these jobs, so they kind of know what folks' qualifications are so that when these jobs arise, they're able to kind of make those connections. We regularly follow up with developers, and we have an entire team at EDC that's devoted to kind of me metrics and keeping track there and ensuring that the developers are in compliance with those, with those uh, contract provisions. Uh, that, I guess that's where we were going with that. So is there any type of requirement for follow-up upon the completion of the workforce that has to be submitted to EDC to show they're in compliance? Yeah, so we get regular reports from the developers um, in regards to hiring, and we, we keep very close eye on them uh, in regards to that.
or Councilman Parrott Levy. Nope, that's it, final question. Thanks for having the hearing. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Cohen and Rivera. Uh, Donovan Rich, Councilman Richards, you have questions? Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for having this uh, hearing. A few questions, so, um, so you spoke of jobs and obviously the creation of, is it 5,000 jobs? Wanted to hear a little bit more about your strategy on connecting uh, local communities, especially on the outskirts of the airport to uh, these jobs. Yes, so uh, thank you, Council Member. We know that um, a large part of your district is, is near JFK and that um, it's a very important job center for, for the area that you represent. Um, so Ryan can speak to some of the efforts that EDC does in regards to air cargo and the actual operations of JFK, uh, but in regard to workforce development in particular, um, any of the investments we're making, in particular, there's one RFP that's open right now for a um, new distribution facility near JFK. So um, that is one of these developments where, um, you know, that the, the higher NYC language that I was discussing is included. So um, respondents there will have to um, include in their responses kind of uh, projected jobs numbers, and we will hold them to um, hiring locally first. I think in, in your particular instance, um, if there's anything, uh, if there's any local organizations that we should be speaking with or um, any, other, any other folks in, in your community that you think that we might be able to forge partnerships with, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to do that. And now we, uh, we obviously created the JFKI bid so they've Absolutely. been a strong partner and certainly but they're ramping up and sort of learning the lay of the land but one of the things I'm looking for is I think something a little bit more tangible and perhaps that looks like a, perhaps it could look like an SBS workforce one center satellite site for that part of uh, Springfield Gardens uh, and I partly say that because it's it's you know, it's, there's been very little connection between that industry and local communities. And through the IBID, like I said, we're starting to forge those partnerships, mm -hmm. but, um, but we're still behind the times. And, and, and many of these jobs are a, a pipeline right into the middle class. So we wanna ensure we're tying our local residents into that. Um, have you given any thought process so obviously we have the, the ferry service running out have you given any thought to utilizing the waterways a little bit more and, and partly one of the reasons I want to speak on that uh, for this particular area is that we are uh, you know right on the outskirts of the airport which means that when you talk about pollution we're getting a lot of the the, the airports uh, traffic the airplanes uh, pollution but then also uh, trucks 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 uh, are overwhelmingly uh, uh, continue to be a big issue for the district, whether it's illegal parking, and perhaps from an environmental standpoint, uh, I'm not sure if many of these trucks are using clean diesel, I have no idea, but if I'm a betting person, majority of them are not. So what is your plan to, to certainly ensure that uh, we're minimizing the impacts of trucks in these local communities? Thank you, Council Member, uh, for that question uh, regarding sort of the use of our waterways as well as how we might be able to better mitigate truck impacts in our neighborhoods. Um, so Freed NYC really does call for, uh, you know, the better utilization of our waterways um, for, you know, barging of goods, whether that be containerized cargo or palletized cargo, as I had mentioned. Um, we've also been thinking about perhaps um, moving uh, domestic truck trailers by, by barge um, across uh, the harbor. Um, and really, you know, those, uh, I should also mention rail investments are, are the other piece of this as well. And in really shifting in our freight is first getting even into the city because we have a lot of large trucks, 53 foot trucks that are coming in from nearby states and driving through. Uh, but we think that we can move a lot of that freight instead in a rail car or perhaps on a barge uh, to its destination. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of this plan is, is finding those opportunities and that's why we think these investments are smart and strategic by, by, by building a barge terminal, by building rail facilities, you, you can incentivize that change to happen. Um, I will say that for the you know, last mile truck deliveries, um, you know, with the freight system we will, we will always have trucks primarily doing the last and final mile uh, delivery. Uh, but in the Freight NYC plan, we really call for the investment in clean trucks so that whatever truck isn't you know, moved to perhaps a rail car or a barge, that that truck operates with cleaner fuels, it's smaller, it's safer, that sort of thing. So, Will that be part I, of the RFP? 
I'm sorry? Will that be part of the RFPs? As it yes, so we, we have been building into our RFPs language that stipulates that these are our policy goals um, and that we essentially, uh, you know, select respondents based on how well they can, you know, uh, say that they'll be uh, adopting these goals. And, and now, how much more of a, sorry, and I'm, this is my last question, Paul. How much of an increase of truck traffic do you anticipate with uh, your plan, especially near JFK? So, uh, in regards to, you know, isolated truck traffic out near JFK, um, we haven't, uh, you know, quantified that specifically, but, um, you know, if we can, you know, push for these investments, we think we can slow the growth of trucks if we do nothing. Um, that's the thing that we, we don't want to do. We've got to do something, and we think that this is the first good thing out of the gate. Um, in regards to the, you know, facility out near JFK, um, that will be a, you know, probably an air cargo focused uh, location, um, smaller in size, uh, I would say, um, but still important in supporting, you know, the JFK community and all of the jobs out there. Um, but we can certainly, uh, you know, look into that. Um, and, and one thing that I would add with uh, the particular RFP that's out for the um, potential distribution air, uh, center or truck plaza near JFK, we know that a big issue for Springfield Gardens and other neighborhoods, I know um, Chair Vallone has mentioned this as well in regards to College Point, is that trucks are idling on city streets and residential areas. So, you know, if there's a degree to which um, we can activate city-owned parcels to allow trucks that would ordinarily be doing that on city streets um, to do that in an isolated um, um, you know, facility that's in an existing industrial zone. You know, we think that's better for our air quality and for our neighbors. Yeah, and I'll closing now, and I'll just close with these statements. Um, you know, one of the things I'm going to be most interested in seeing, and, and partly with our work with the NYPD, um, one of the things that they often mention is that there's really, even if they wanted to do a lot more enforcement, there's no place to actually tow the trucks to. There's limited space. So in this plan, I'm hoping as we come back to the table that that's going to be uh, thought out, um, you know, throughout, throughout the, the RFP process. So I want to hear a little bit more about that. And I think for uh, Council Member Vallone's district and myself, and it's something I've mentioned to, to the department as well, the NYPD, perhaps some truck enforcement units just specifically dedicated to our communities. Um, and, uh, and lastly, uh, the NYPD certainly can use more heavy duty tow trucks. And I think they only have about two that are actually operational for the entire city. They have five, but two actually work. So we want to hear a little bit more of uh, sound investment going into they only sure have one, more enforcement. They only have one boot for the yeah. trucks at this point. So exactly. we can't even, yeah. even when we find a truck, yeah. we can't even boot <laughs> the truck because we don't have a boot big enough yeah. to put on yeah. the trucks. Thank you, uh, Councilman Vallon. So we look forward to uh, continued work. Understand the delicate balance between jobs and growth and moving goods, but we need to make sure we protect the quality of life for our residents as well. Thank you. And, and following on that, I'd like to keep questions on the same topic. So we're going to go to Councilmember Barron. But before that, since Councilmember Richards brought up JFK, I think there's an opportunity there. Obviously, with the billions of dollars being invested in LaGuardia and JFK, um, I guess my hope is that there will be some coordination now with what we're envisioning for this light rail and a new distribution hub there with the new planned JFK and LaGuardia so we don't have to uh, do this again. I mean, if the funds are going in there, I think this is a perfect opportunity to utilize the rebuilding of these airports with the future of light rail and barges versus commercial traffic so we can kind of do it all at the same time. Is, is that happening? Uh, thank you, Councilmember, for that question. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, thinking holistically, improving access to the airports, um, uh, you know, at this point, we, we have worked on improving, uh, you know, the Van Wick um, in terms of, you know, making sure that's a, uh, a designated truck route for 53-foot trucks. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, other uh, uh, access issues that might be passenger-related, um, I, I can't speak to that at this point, uh, but we can certainly connect with our, with our partners that there are, are more um, uh, tuned into that um, development, so we can certainly follow up with you. So it sounds like an area I think we can we can either join forces on. I think I think that's a lot of this. There's a lot of groups. God bless you that were mentioned, and I think it's it's just coordinating 
our efforts mm -hmm. on this plan. I think it would be a great way for us to have a seat at the table with these airports. I yeah. keep saying all the council members that are surrounded by these airports in Queens in particular, and yet we really don't have a say as to how they're being built and what we should do. I think this is a perfect area where we can say, hey, we, we have a long-term vision here of reducing truck traffic. The redevelopment of our two major airports should incorporate. This is what EDC's plan is, and we want to have a seat at the table. And I think there was a hearing prior to uh, us taking over EDC with Councilmember Grodnick about the viable and non-viable land actually on JFK, that there's actually a lot of space there we can't use. So have, have we looked at maybe expanding the use of some of those areas at the airport for, for our intents and purposes? Uh, in terms of sort of re rethinking how JFK is structured, you know, yes, we have thought about how, you know, that uh, distribution space could be better um, configured, uh, but I will say that, you know, it is largely a, a Port Authority, uh, you know, project uh, overseen by them. Um, but it's absolutely a great question in thinking about, you know, the land out at the airport and can we think, you know, more strategically about the alignment of buildings and are they better being, being utilized as they should be? So that's a great uh, point and we'll absolutely, uh, you know, want to think about that. Um, yeah, I think a big pet peeve of mine since since come is is all the well, it's Port Authority, it's MTA, it's that. I, mm -hmm. I think with these projects, we should absolutely have a, a a seat at the table as to what we're talking about because we're the city that they're working in. So I think we can take this opportunity with these capital projects, since the city's working with capital plans, to say, all right, let's have that joint hearing, let's have a hearing, and let's let's work on that because this is an opportunity that's not going to come around again. Right, and this is, um, I will say, you know, this is, um, we're three or so months into a, what is kind of a 10-year plan and set of strategies, so um, it, it's great that we're having this hearing now and can have these discussions because we're really at kind of a jumping off point for a lot of a lot of those productive conversations that we can have with our partners at the Port Authority and at the state level. We, we, we kind of take credit for timing these hearings at the right <laughs> time, that's a good thing. Council Member Barron, I know you have some questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. I have questions about the, um, har the Cross Harbor Freight Movement Project. So I understand that you're looking to utilize the rails that are in Sunset Park, which are part of the Bay Ridge Freight Line. Is that connected to the trains that parallel the L Line in the East New York section of Brooklyn? Is that a part of that Bay Ridge? It comes across, it goes, along Junior Street where the L train is and uh, underneath there. Thank you, Council Member, uh, for the question. Uh, I believe, so to step back a little bit about, um, you know, the rail freight that, that comes through what we call the Southern Corridor into New York City. Um, the, the, the Cross Harbor Freight Program is, is a Port Authority program um, that oversees the development of, of rail infrastructure that happens to touch New Jersey as well as New York State. Um, once, a, once a train, for example, comes into, let's say, the Brooklyn waterfront, um, it is then passed off to what is called the New York and Atlantic Railway and begins its journey up the Bay Ridge Line. Um, at that point, I believe it, uh, it does touch or runs parallel to the N and the R as it sort of turns north and, mm -hmm. and gets into Queens. I believe it is the L train. Um, apologies, I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not a resident of that area, okay. but I can certainly Maybe lean on other Well, as you, as you can train. imagine, it's in my district. Yes. I just wanted to confirm that that was, in fact, a part of that line. Yes. What does that mean, then, in terms of revitalization of that area, which is a very stark area, revitalization of that area? Uh, what kind of increased trafficking are we going to see with the trains? What's the number of trains that you project? Mm -hmm. And what's the environmental impact that it's going to have? Have you done those studies to make an assessment of the air quality, the noise, the frequency of trains, and how that will impact our community. That's a great follow-up, thank you. Uh, in terms of the, the rail investments that are called out in Freight NYC, uh, we think that a very smart uh, investment are, are in these transload facilities uh, that you're probably referring to in the plan. Um, and it's essentially a uh, site in which, you know, we may build extra track um, so that uh, an additional rail car or two can be delivered um, to that area, which happens to be already exist an industrial area, um, so that it can support a nearby industrial business, for example. Um, 
the focus of the plan is really to stay within these existing in industrial areas so, they're, so that we're not you know, impacting nearby uh, neighborhoods. Um, and when you know, this happens, um, we don't forecast you know, several new trains every day. Um, right now, the Bay Ridge Line sees about one train every day, and that happens at night. Right. Um, this, with these investments, we would perhaps see an additional a uh, few rail cars to that train, so we wouldn't be seeing a staggering number of new trains uh, running through the neighborhood. Um, uh, uh, so, so we think these are these are good investments uh, that will support uh, you know nearby industrial businesses, and as Will had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, connecting those job opportunities to to you know your community uh, or other communities nearby. So it starts at, in Sunset Park, it goes through parts of Brooklyn. Where does it terminate and what happens to the products sure. at that end line? So uh, when it uh, goes through Brooklyn and then sort of goes north up, up into Queens, um, along the Bay Ridge Line, there are several rail, rail spurs that just sort of, uh, uh, sort of jut out of the main line. Um, they're almost like little off ramps for rail cars to serve businesses. Um, it actually keeps going up to the Fresh Pond Yard um, in Queens, um, and that's, that's a, a switching yard, essentially, where rail cars uh, can either be sent to the west via the lawn, uh, Lower Montauk branch um, into sort of the Long Island City area, or they can go east um, into Long Island. Um, a lot of the freight that actually, we, the, the rail freight that comes into New York City does come from the north, um, and, uh, and sort of meets at the Fresh Pond Yard and then goes out. Uh, but for, for the Bay Ridge Line, which is less used than the Northern Corridor, um, it's still an important freight corridor that, uh, that we think that there are opportunities to better utilize. Thank you. I just want to say, if you're talking about making changes and adding even one car, I would appreciate an environmental assessment, talking about the increased noise and traffic and all that comes with that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Barron. And that, that's going to be the first round of our questions is talking about the quality of life impact as we expand, as we expand on that. We've also been joined by Councilmember Lander. I also wanted to give an opportunity to both Council Members Rivera and Lander to vote on the resolution extending the helicopter route to the Northeast. So if we could have that. Continuation roll call committee on economic development, resolution 178A, Council Member Lander. Uh, I vote aye. And Mr. Chair, I also look forward to continuing the conversation about our uh, Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn yes. helicopters, where we continue to have we actually urgent, your urgent work to do. I vote aye. We did. Council Member Rivera? Aye. Vote now currently stands at 10 in the affirmative. OK, thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, you, you envision the goals, the four goals of, within the testimony. And I think a, a large part of that is working with your existing locations and then expanding that and then finding new locations. So I guess the first question would be which, which locations are you looking to expand that already exist and which are the new set of locations that you're looking to expand to? And then you could take that either way. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, expanding uh, existing locations, um, you know, as mentioned, we want to stay uh, within industrial, the existing industrial footprints of our industrial business zones. Um, for example, um, you know, in Sunset Park, uh, the new uh, Brooklyn Army Terminal development, uh, which will be going in um, in the coming years, that's, that's in an existing industrial area that is served by both maritime and rail freight infrastructure. So that's, that's a great example of what we're trying to do. And there's uh, an RFP? And there, there, is a, there is an RFP that has been released um, with responses due, I believe, next month. Um, and you know, that, is a, that is a great uh, example of a building modern warehouse that we know the market needs. Um, vacancy rates are very low. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is an opportunity for us to sort of uh, control our destiny in terms of getting the jobs back in New York City as opposed to seeing them all go to New Jersey. Um, other locations... Uh, well, before you jump to other locations, let's just yep. finish off on that one. So what is the scope of that RFP and what do you envision coming to there to alleviate the life rail? Sure. So what is the vision there? So the vision of the, the Brooklyn Army Terminal uh, distribution develop, uh, development is to see uh, a mix of modern uh, distribution space as well as uh, production space so that if a business is manufacturing or producing some 
uh, something that they can then use the space below to distribute whatever is being made. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, we will certainly encourage the use of these cleaner, smaller trucks for delivery um, into Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and, and, and we certainly want to, uh, you know, bet, as best as possible use the adjacent rail yard um, at the 65th Street rail yard uh, that we oversee along with the Port Authority. Um, and then nearby is the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, both of which are multimodal uh, assets that, that, you know, we, uh, you know, develop and, and manage. And so we want to see and ensure that there's a way that this is sort of a, a, a cohesive ecosystem happening in Sunset Park. So will the light rail vision of this plan be incorporated to the existing Port Authority hub that's right there? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't speak to the light rail so much. That's uh, not my uh, purview, but we can certainly check that and get back to you. So Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see yeah. that. To me, that's the, the answer for bringing some of the commercial truck congestion, which is a main for all of us, one of the top calls into our offices. God bless you. Is the is the non-stop onslaught of commercial truck traffic. So, overall, I'm a big proponent of the plan. Any way that we can reduce that footprint on New Yorkers every day is, is a wonderful thing. So I'm looking at this as a first opportunity to do that. Great, and I'd like to add a couple things about that RFP. Um, uh, just just kind of to add some color on the on the trucks piece there. Uh, so as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, within the RFP as released, we have individual goals that we, we hope that respondents will meet and ask them to meet. Uh, one of those goals is to um, incorporate sustainability as possible, so kind of that clean trucking model, perhaps some alternative fueling, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's one of the goals listed in the RFP. Um, another one of the goals is to make those connections to the rail and to the, to the Maritimes. And so our, our assets in Sunset Park are quite unique because uh, like Ryan said, they have the, the both connection to maritime and the connection to the rail. So um, both having clean and sustainable trucking and having multimodal connections are key goals in that RFP. I'll also say... Do um, we have any incentives to achieve those goals in the RFP, or is it it's like what we had with the helicopter initiative? Is there, is there ways for us to incentivize those goals? So, you know, throughout the, the RFP process, they will get back with, uh, with certain responses. We'll have an opportunity to negotiate and perhaps see if there need to be some, some levers like that. Uh, but we're, we're still right now waiting to see what the proposals come back with. Yeah, I think the council members would be thrilled to see the, the use of clean energy in the RFP and, and that reduction to bring to those set neighborhoods in Brooklyn, just like we would in College Point or anywhere else. Right, absolutely. And then, and then one more thing I'd like to add on that um, in regards to um, the sort of traffic uh, on an isolated basis that that facility might be delivering. Um, the, the RFP responses, we are asking for a um, kind of breakdown of the truck traffic, of the rail traffic, and the maritime traffic that they are anticipating that the, the new facility would create. So uh, the RFP offers, I believe, um, approximately 500,000 square feet uh, for development. So this is, a, this is a large project, and I think, um, you know, Council Member Menchaca is uh, we, we've spoken with him quite a bit that there are uh, 500 jobs at least for the for the local community here, uh, but you know obviously we need to examine and have on an upfront basis um, a good knowledge of kind of what the what the impacts will be. So we're trying to be proactive about that. Well, I think this is a perfect example, if you don't mind, to kind of use this site on all the other type of hearings we've had with the council members. Now, so much of that, so much of that is interagency cooperation, right? So if if we're going to have uh, a new plan for that site that's going to involve increased traffic of any kind. So how is the process with DOT and working with the street infrastructure, and what is EDC's role with that? And I think that's a big part of where the council members want to be involved in. There has to be a budgetary commitment through EDC or DOT or the administration, and that was a big issue for us in College Point. The streets were forgotten. So whether the police get it, whatever came in, whatever wonderful idea it was, the streets just collapsed. So even though it might sound like a great idea, if, unless we have a full plan for that beyond it, the RFP, we'd love to see EDC's role with the administration and the city agencies in any way increased to make sure that the streets are enhanced, the local community boards are engaged, the site selection process, which is a big part of this. So I'll just let you take it from there. But I think this is a perfect example of are those steps being taken? Yeah, uh, that's a it's a great question. Uh, you know, we have been working with uh, you know collaboratively collaboratively with DOT on thinking about um, sort of the street network of Sunset Park, um, uh, including you know First and Second Avenues uh, in that neighborhood, which see a lot of truck activity. There's also a rail line that goes down First Avenue um, that is operated by New York New Jersey Rail, which is a Port Authority 
Does airline. EDC have a DOT requirement for a study prior to a project, or is that something maybe we could institute? Should there be, uh, at the same time of a large-scale EDC project, or any project, a, a simultaneous DOT impact study on the local streets that would help you and help them to say, okay, once this goes in, this is what we envision as needs to be done on the local crosswalks and the streets and the schools. Um, so I, I would say that with, with the, both the, the Freight NYC plan in general and in this, this particular project, you know, we're staying very closely coordinated with DOT. I think, as Ryan said, with um, kind of continuing development in Sunset Park and um, kind of a doubling down of city policy on protecting those industrial jobs, that's important that we take a look at, you know, how that growth will, um, will be impacted. So I think with the, um, the information that we've requested from the respondents in terms of uh, their forecasting of what the, what the impacts might be, that will allow us to say, you know, even more closely coordinated with DOT in terms of seeing what they think from their perspective, seeing what the police department thinks from their perspective about how these, um, you know, sorts of developments might impact the congestion and, and traffic flow. I think there may be an opportunity for us on the council then to kind of create some type of requirement that there is this interagency cooperation for any of these projects because what happens is we get left with a district that's that's either not prepared for the street traffic for the flow once something's created and each agency saying it's their budget it's their budget it's their budget and we're left saying it's going back to our constituents saying and i think to assist you assist the edc on these projects we may need to require or mandate that those studies be done at the same time so that we don't leave a community after the fact, even though it's a great project, but now all of a sudden there's all these community board concerns and civic groups, and I think this could be a great opportunity, not just targeting the freight project, but anything else, yeah. that and I think it's part of the EDC's uh, vision, and I think with the council members, that we want to be included within the scope, the planning, the site selection, and I think even beyond that, the interagency for me on any committee I sit on is always seems to be lacking, because whatever topic we're talking about. It's like, well, what about traffic? What about the NYPD? What about fire? What about schools and the construction? So I, I think this could be a great opportunity for us. Right, and I would say that, um, you know, for this project and others, the um, the environmental review process, for example, is a, is a great opportunity for us to kind of exactly. consult with our sister agencies. And a lot of those requirements, I would say, are, are, are kind of built into the process for permitting, both at the, the, the city level, but also uh, state and federal levels in terms of making sure that we consult about, um, you know, with our sister agencies. On, the, on what those impacts might be and how to mitigate them. So I'll just go back. So besides the Brooklyn Terminal, what other sites would we be expanding? And, or do we need to just include new sites at this point? Uh, so we've been uh, thinking about the, the future uh, of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center um, at ADC, uh, you know, ensuring that those facilities are modern. Yeah, that lease is coming up, so that'd be a I'm, perfect time. I'm sorry. That, that lease is coming up, so it'd be a right. So time. we, uh, you know, we um, we want to make sure that the facilities up there that that feed New York um, are ready for the 21st century. Um, we've been uh, looking at, uh, you know, sort of the Maspeth area as well, which um, if you look at a heat map um, and if uh, you see all the distribution properties, they all sort of, uh, it all heats up in, in sort of the Maspeth, North, North Brooklyn, kind of Long Island City area. There's a lot of distribution activity happening um, that actually does have rail running through it. And that's why we looked at it was because, again, we want to make sure that we're developing uh, sites that are connected to the multimodal rail or maritime networks. Um, uh, we've also been... Is there a, a timeline for those sites that you're envisioning, or is it just in the next year, two years, five years? Yeah, it's definitely within the next couple of years. Um, uh, the, I have to say the Brooklyn Army Terminal uh, site is certainly farther along than the others uh, because that was a clear, discrete site that we control um, uh, and can oversee. The other locations we certainly want to uh, to look at and to ensure that those areas are preserved and enhanced for distribution. Um, the other location is uh, on Staten Island, um, uh, where we have this confluence of uh, incredible freight activity, including, as I mentioned, the Global Container Terminal as well as the uh, Arlington Rail Yard. Um, there are other sites that could be better leveraged, uh, uh, we believe, uh, for future distribution uh, into New York City. Well, I think Staten Island, going across has been a big problem from New Jersey to New York, and I, I think since you mentioned Staten Island, I think there's such few options. One of the ones you'd mentioned that we talked was the Cross Harbor Tunnel. Do we have any update on, on where we are with the possibility of, of going forward with the tunnel, especially for freight traffic? 
Sure. Uh, so um, just want to mention that that is a Port Authority project um, uh, that they're overseeing, um, and they are in the midst of their uh, Tier 2 environmental impact statement uh, that looks at two alternatives, one of which is the rail tunnel, the other the enhanced car float operation. Uh, I can't at this time speak about the status of that uh, EIS that they're working on, uh, but we can uh, go back and, and check with them to see what the status is. I, I do know that that is a longer term solution to addressing truck traffic into the city. Um, obviously, the, the rail tunnel itself would be a bigger investment, um, but certainly um, you know, impactful in removing trucks from New York City streets. And I would say as well that the, um, the, the rail investments that EDC is considering making through this plan would complement the, the Cross Harbor Freight Program. Although they are separate, um, we are you know, kind of staying coordinated and uh, the, they would help each other. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to um, zero back on, I guess, the site selection and some of the job creation, but we've been joined by Councilmember Lander and Councilmember Menchaca, so I'd like a chance for Councilmember Lander if you have any questions, and also for Councilmember Menchaca to vote. On, when he comes back, Bill just stepped out. So when he comes back, we'll let you vote on the resolution. Councilmember Lander? Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. So uh, this is a good uh, segue because I'm going to ask a little more about the tunnel and how it fits in. And, you know, I guess I have kind of a couple of questions. Well, my question is on what is it that we are tracking and trying to achieve? Freight NYC has a jobs goal, and jobs are good, but it feels like we have a freight a truck problem, a freight problem, and it's not clear to me how we're measuring what it looks like to actually improve on that. And then part two is, m my sense is that as ambitious as it is, that the Cross Harbor Rail Freight Tunnel is the only thing that to me sounds like it could have a really significant impact in reducing trucks and changing the way that freight is brought into New York City. Now. It's, got a, it's a big political hurdle. It has been for decades. Thankfully, Congressman Nadler has stuck with it, or it would be gone from our sense of political priorities. I think it's really only due to his keeping it lifted up that we keep talking about it. But it's got a set of challenges. Obviously, at this moment, with this federal government, you know, luckily the EIS is not due back till 2022, and hopefully we'll have a different president and a different Congress, and they'll be serious about infrastructure investment. But am I right that, like, that's the thing that would actually make a significant difference in reducing trucks and changing our freight operations. Um, if so, shouldn't we be doing more to fight to make it happen? And if you want to try to persuade me that actually Freight NYC will have a bigger impact, like there's nothing in it that I'm unhappy with that all seems good. It just doesn't feel to me like it adds up to something that has any significant chance of really significantly changing the modes that freight comes in or solving the problems that we think exist. That's a lot of sure. overlapping questions. No, thank you, uh, Council Member, for the question. Um, so you mentioned sort of measuring success and tracking uh, various metrics. Um, I will say that, you know, this uh, project for NOC does fall under New York Works, so our, our main metric that we're tracking is job creation. Um, so that is our biggest target uh, for us. But it's not to say that we certainly won't be considering truck reduction and truck diversion, because as we know, that is one of our biggest challenges and issues in terms of uh, ensuring that our you know economy continues to hum along. Um, in terms of the interventions that we've outlined, you know we think this is a, a great and strategic first start. Um, you know. As you mentioned, uh, you know we haven't, you know, seen the uh, infrastructure uh, investments that we'd like from the federal government. But this is our chance to to start this and to start modernizing our network and to really th rethink, you know, how we're moving goods in New York City because we cannot depend on trucks to do that. So we're basically making these investments in maritime infrastructure, in rail infrastructure. We have this underutilized uh, network of rivers and channels that could be moving freight from one side to the next. And so, you know, our development of a barge terminal is saying, look, we think this is a smart decision. Let's get this going. Um, and, you know, that's uh, something that we're developing with uh, members of this uh, North Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance um, that has just formed. Uh, and from the rail side, you know, you mentioned the Cross Harbor Tunnel. That would absolutely have a huge impact on sort of the more efficient movement of freight into New York City. Um, we think that, uh, you know, just ourselves here at the city, we can actually begin to, to sort of lay the groundwork so that that can happen. 
Um, and the way we do that is by enhancing and expanding the sort of rail freight that we, the sites that we have in the city. Um, and so that when a, tra uh, when a train, for example, comes into New York, it, ha it will have a place to put those rail cars, for example. Because um, without it, you would just have, you know, a train into the city. So, so our rail facilities would, would uh, complement what the Port Authority is trying to, doing, trying to do, but this is merely a, a sort of a first step uh, in modernizing our network. And, and council member, respectfully, I would also add um, um, from the kind of maritime perspective as well, um, you know, we saw through the research that we did in, in regards to, to writing this plan that, um, you know, other cities around the country are 60%, maybe 70% reliant on trucks, whereas New York City is 90%. And that's all despite the fact that we are a city of islands and surrounded by waterways. So, you know, both in looking at the... Um, rail access to the city, but also the maritime and how we can kind of open up the waterways. You know, we're looking at Hunts Point as a, as a place that, again, surrounded by water, um, one of the main food hubs for the city. We think there's a real opportunity there for, for some more maritime shipping. And, you know, we know that once you get um, goods onto a barge, it's seven to nine times more uh, environmentally friendly in terms of emissions reductions and all that. So um, there's absolutely a lot that we would love to see come out of the Cross Harbor program, but I think, you know, right now in order to kind of look at where New York City is uh, in, in comparison with the rest of the country in terms of what our mode share is right now to, to kind of push in that direction um, as, as best as we can with the city's levers that we have. So I, I love, you know, the maritime uh, investments as well as the rail investments, and I, you know, though I think the Cross Harbor Rail at scale has a, a different potential for impact, I'm all for the things that we can do. I just want to get clear in terms of your metrics, which I think would would be both mode shift. Are we at you know, which you know, it's it's frustrating to measure if even if a lot of uh, you know a whole lot of barges still only are one percent. So I, I mean, if you would want to have those be in you know in containers in metric tons as well as in percentage modal shift so that it just doesn't feel as depressing as like, well, we got a 0.3% reduction, but you know, I'm open. Um, but it, and maybe, I guess I'd love to understand a little better whether we have those or we're looking at those. I, I'm pro jobs, but I don't think that is like saying this is a jobs pro, like if we could create 5,000 jobs by like, you know, stacking containers and unstacking them. Like if the, the goal here is to, if we know we have a significant problem and we are trying to achieve mode shift, we need to be tracking those setting goals that are as ambitious as we can for what can move onto barges and what can move onto rail. But some of that is also being honest because if we can't, if the plan we have, as, as good as it is and as much as the details are right, is pretty modest in the impacts that it has, and if those impacts are harmful for the city and are going to get worse, then I guess this is like, I appreciate what you said that the things you're doing are complementary to Cross Harbor, but I, I don't feel good with thinking of it as like, here's what the city is doing and here's what the Port Authority is doing. The Port Authority is not doing Cross Harbor. If we want it to happen, we are, will have to build a movement and political consensus and political will and push for funding for it. And it doesn't feel to me like we're doing that. It feels to me like we're saying, yeah, we're for it, go Jerry and thinking in the back of our heads, it's never gonna happen, so why put our energy into it? And if, I, I guess I'd either think we should say that aloud, like if that's actually what people think they should say it, and if what we think is we really need it, then we need to orient ourselves around a set of metrics and a set of politics that in the long run, like this might not, we're not gonna have Cross Harbor in the time of the de Blasio administration, but if the de Blasio administration thinks this is a critical priority for the future of our city, Let's do more to make it clear, to measure it, to articulate it, to push so that the next mayor sees it as a critical priority too, and so we all get on board with what's necessary. Which kind of summarizes the, what type of job creation do you envision for this, I think is a good summary of what Councilmember Lander was saying, and maybe we can expand upon that. And, and actually really quick on what Councilmember Lander was saying, I, I definitely um, want to be really clear that we, we, we do think it is a priority for the region, and we, we really appreciate your support and the fact that um, you know, we, you, that we want to make this plan as ambitious as possible because we are dealing with a very real problem here. The, the statistics that we came up with were that the uh, freight volumes by 2045 would increase by nearly 70%. So whether the city responds or not, this is happening. 
Um, you know, whether the city responds or not to these industry trends, to the construction boom that's happening here, there's a lot of goods coming in here and it's only going to get bigger. So um, whether the city responds or not, it's happening and we need to make sure that we're making the proper investment. So absolutely would love to continue the conversation on how we can be more ambitious here and continue to you know, act, uh, actively quantify these goals and you know, continue to push and push and push. If we could continue the roll call for, for both of the council members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution. Thank you. Continuation roll call, resolution 178A, Council Member Menchaca. Enthusiastically, aye. <laughs> and can you, and I would like to be put on as a co-sponsor if I can. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, and I, okay. Amanda, did you, you vote? Okay, great. And now I think we have some, absolutely, sorry. Final vote in resolution 178A now stands at 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. And now questions from Council Member Menchaca. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and and I, I'm, uh, I joined the Chair and, and the members of this committee in thanking you again for coming here and talking about, I think, a very important piece. Sunset Park is playing a very critical role in this uh, vision and implementing with the first RFP. And what I want to really focus on in thinking about this RFP uh, is also in relationship to the private spaces that are also kind of doing their own market-driven things, very similar to the Sunset Park Freight Hub, and thinking about Red Hook, for example, and some of the Amazon and et cetera spaces. So my first question to you is, how are you analyzing not just the Sunset Park Brooklyn Army Terminal location, but all of the market-driven forces that are popping up freight and last mile delivery for, for New York City? Some of those are not connected to rail, Many of those are not connected to rail or maritime, but are going to be bringing more trucks to our neighborhoods. Tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about that. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Menchaca, about sort of the uh, sort of analyzing the what's driving the market for these types of developments. Is that is that right? Um, you know, we know that uh, vacancy rates are very low for modern distribution space in New York City. It's about 5%. Uh, it's actually le below 2% if it's food related uh, processing. So, uh, you know, real estate is incredibly tight uh, for this type of space. And we know at the city that we have land that uh, can address this this challenge um, and that that should be and, and we know that you know in your district with the Brooklyn Army terminal that's that's a great area in which we can not only sort of counter that vacancy rate but also create jobs for members for for uh, your constituents so we think that's that's a great opportunity um, in terms of uh, you know other metrics um, you know we can continue to think about that um, uh, and perhaps get back to you uh, but you know, um, you know, we think that this is just something that is happening. It's coming. Um, these are areas of the city that, you know, it's historically had this type of activity. Uh, in a way, it's coming back because, you know, the the market no truckers don't want to pick up uh, freight in our harbor, drive out to New Jersey, and then drive all the way back. They want to be closer to consumers. They want to be closer to industrial businesses, so that they don't have to drive as far pollute as much, congest as, as many roadways. So, so this is an interesting time, and we see it as a good thing. And I guess what I'm, I'm referring to, I mean, this, maybe I'll leave this question if you have an answer to it, but what I'm seeing here is really connected to what uh, Councilmember Lander was speaking to, this, the, the tunnel. And the tunnel is really the thing that's going to game change the whole thing. But short of that, we're going to rely on these big ships to come not to Brooklyn, uh, we're going we're gonna to have our limited capacity in South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which we're about to get up, um, activated, and the Red Hook Terminal to do some barging back and forth. That's growing. Um, but at the end of the day, these big containers are going to go to New Jersey, and we're going to have to ship them over here in some way. And that the only thing that's really changing is these last mile delivery pieces that big trucks are going to come dump stuff there, and then the small trucks are going to go to the neighborhoods. We're not, we're changing the way that this last mile is going to look like, and I'm seeing a lot of green truck or, or clean trucks, but we're not solving the ultimate problem. And, and so I'm just looking at it from a different perspective from what Lander spoke to, but I want to hear analysis about that and how, how we can use other tools, land use, uh, laws, local laws, to start shifting that market. And I know that EDC always is squirmish about trying to make 
changes in the market. There's a lot of fights that we're having on a bunch of other things. But this is, I think, going to be important for us to kind of have a holistic approach. And the land use piece uh, is really important because we're having a battle keeping industrial, industrial, keeping maritime, maritime. And I'm thinking about Red Hook Terminal and the basin and what's happening there. One council, the next council member could sh shift that and, and, and if the governor has a di different vision than the next mayor, we're, we're now we're losing these uh, opportunities that you're trying to invest in. And uh, we have some bigger problems here. And if we don't create advocacy and political power on the, on the land side with people that don't even know about this stuff because this is so analytical, then we're, we're gonna lose these battles on the land use on this floor here in the city council because council members have ultimate power here. And I'm holding, I'm holding the, um, I'm holding the line, but I'm only one person and there's some bigger interests here. I don't know if you have any th thoughts about that. No, and that brings up right before, what we were talking about was that cross interagency council community action on all of these projects and the holistic approach and how that comes up at every one of our EDC hearings. So that's perfect question on what we were talking about, so. I, I will say, Council Member Machaca, that's a great point about land use in terms of preserving the maritime and industrial activity that we have in the city. Um, we have, through this process, coordinated with uh, the Department of City Planning, and we hope to do so more uh, in ensuring that the areas that have this industrial activity remain. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, for example, I mentioned earlier Maspeth being a very important uh, part of the freight ecosystem for New York City. Um, we have uh, Newtown Creek, which is the most heavily used, what we call secondary channel in New York City. A lot of barging happens on that channel. A lot of aggregate, fuel, other materials are moved by, by barge up that channel um, and serve businesses there. Um, and that is a great example of a industrial business being served by the water. And there are no trucks bringing in uh, you know, t to serve that business. It's, it's coming in on a barge. Um, those are those are assets that we need to remember and, and protect. Um, those those sort of secondary channels that, that I had mentioned earlier, um, and that you know we you know have to be uh, strategic in in supporting a lot of the distribution that has that you know rail next to it or perhaps a creek next to it. So thank you. And and I would add as well just um, to really double down on the fact that you know especially with this freight plan the city is. We are, we're taking a look and we just, it, it's critically important to protect the industrial area that the city has. And, you know, we see um, historically that the, the use of uh, waterways for, uh, for freight transportation has gone way down, that the use of rail for freight transportation has gone way down. And we think that this is really a place where we can kind of reactivate those uses. But to do that, like you said, council member, we need to maintain the land use in those areas that makes this possible. And I think um, in regard to kind of industry move, uh, industry movement, like you were talking about, we are seeing a move um, where um, where shippers are getting frustrated, like Ryan said, with long trips back and forth from New Jersey. Uh, congestion is costing more and more and more to these companies, which oftentimes are small businesses just trying to get raw materials for their product. Um, and there really is this move to want to come back to New York City and want to be as close to the consumer as possible, including the construction of um, multi-level warehousing, multi-level industrial spaces. And we know that you've been a big advocate for that and that um, Brooklyn Army Terminal in particular, both the existing campus and uh, what is proposed through this RFP is sort of a multi-level with um, advanced manufacturing taking place in the same building right upstairs from where distribution is taking place. So to the degree that um, EDC can both, like I said, double down and, and work with our, our agency partners to kind of protect these existing industrial areas, but also have kind of uh, market moving projects like the one that we're proposing in your district uh, with the RFP that's out right now, you know, uh, these are great examples to set for the market that the city is committed to to keeping these jobs here and to keeping uh, th these sorts of land uses in the city. Thank you. And last thing I want to say before I hand it back to the chair is uh, program or not programs, but visions like the Triborough, um, the Triborough X, the rail plan. Uh, how does that fit into how you're thinking about, because goods are important to understand to connect to consumers, but consumers and connecting to goods is also important. And I feel like that's the most transformative idea right now that's out there, um, not the BQX. And, and we can be putting energy into something like that where you already have infrastructure and want to move people where there are real transportation deserts in a big way. And uh, 
So just throwing it out there. What, what, how does that as a, because it's also commercial and goods uh, as part of the plan to incorporate both consumer or people uh, transfer and then also goods transfer and really kind of building that line might, might serve us. Is that on your radar? Yeah, so absolutely. I think um, we've actually sat down with, uh, with RPA several times to discuss this. Um, it's, a, it's a great proposal they have, and it would make a big difference for the Bronx and for Central Queens and for Central Brooklyn, like you said, to be able to connect um, on a passenger basis some of these, these places that typically you, know, you have to go all the way into the city to um, transfer between. I think um, you know, right now our position on it is that the, the activities that we're proposing on the Bay Ridge Line do not preclude uh, that, that proposal. And we are excited about that proposal, although we, we do feel that it's very important to protect uh, freight rail transfer within the city because, you know, like I was saying, the, um, with trends over the past few years showing that um, maritime and rail are far below capacity in terms of how we're moving freight, we do feel that it is important to kind of protect uh, the freight right-of-way that we do have. However, um, and I think, you know, also to add to that, I would say that the um, the city is ready to make investments there now, and while the, you know the Triber RX project is a little bit farther off in terms of how funding would be identified, et cetera. That said, um, you know the proposals that we are making to make um, small incremental improvements along the Bay Ridge Line do not preclude that project. Thank you, Councilmember Chaka. Uh, I I should always give a special thank you to the EDC for test. You probably have the longest test of testimony for all the hearings because with 13 council members, there's no way to not go over an hour and a half with the first panel. So I apologize, but this is all really relevant and pertinent questions for everybody's uh, district. And I think that's why everybody fights to be on the EDC committee because it's it's one of the few areas where such a, a viable impact to every community and how we can have a voice in that. So all these topics generate so much interest and we appreciate you guys staying for the whole duration. Councilman Rivera, is there anything that you wanted to add before I finish up my question? So the, I think the Newtown Creek is a, is a good example of like a future incorporation to this project. And then I think then that asks the question of like, what needs to be done to do that? Do we have to like dredge the creeks? Do we have to, can we, is there offsite um, docks there that can be used? Do we have to have increased? Uh, what would be the impact of that? You know, what do we need to get that ready for that? Or is it ready to go? So uh, interestingly, uh, Newtown Creek, as I mentioned, it's the most heavily used secondary channel. A lot is being moved. Um, it also happens to be an EPA Superfund site, so there, there would be some collaboration needed, not just at the local level, but the federal level. Um, and that's ongoing now. I know that's a big concern. Correct. Yes. Um, so uh, as of now, I'm not able to comment too much on um, uh, you know, the sort of EPA's position uh, with the channel, but we certainly like to just uh, remind everyone how, how important it is as sort of, as a maritime asset for the city and, and just remind folks that there's a lot of businesses on that channel uh, that rely on that waterway to move product in and out. Um, and, and barges take a lot of trucks off city streets. Um, so those are so those are great to have in the city. Uh, uh, there's also other locations in the city like East Chester Creek um, and Flushing Bay uh, that have businesses that use their waterways. Um, and those are typically funded, uh, the dredging of those channels is typically funded by the federal government and over, overseen by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, uh, so Do we have any uh, input on the, on the priority of the sites? I know it, was, it took 20 years for uh, Congressmember Crowley to get the Flushing Bay dredged, which was finally done, which is a huge, uh, made a huge difference to have all the businesses and the, and the communities around. Um, but does EDC have a role in that? Yeah, um, so we like to, uh, you know, engage other stakeholders to, to work on this collectively and collaboratively because, uh, you know, it is, it is a big issue. Um, so uh, we'd be happy to work with you and others to, to advocate for the continued dredging of these places to support businesses. Uh, but yes, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, there is only so much federal money that, that is allocated towards dredging. Um, but we certainly advocate for increased uh, dredging of our channels here in New York City. Well, I think that might be one of those airport collaboration because as LaGuardia has to expand and, and grow, so does JFK, there's, there's, there's an opportunity here for funding that is in place that we may be able to use for these type of scenarios, knowing we want to make that a maritime barge facilitator for light rail that we're 
trying to get in some of that uh, capital funding for that purpose. So I always like to think beyond and out of the box for opportunities now that we may not have once those projects are over. Uh, and then it asks a lot for those communities to revisit the continuous construction of certain sites and areas. Um, there's always a concern when we talk about environmental studies, whether it's Newtown Creek or any College Point, Brooklyn, Bronx, um, we're always gonna have opposition to the possibility of that. But if we can show the elimination or the reduction of the commercial truck traffic and the growth of business while we minimize that, I think that's where I think the site select selection process can be collaborative and work well, even though we obviously always have some opposition, but there's an, it gives a chance for us to explain exactly what we're saying here. I think this, that's where the site selection process can be advantageous. When we work with the environmental study, the DOT impact study, to bring a project to say, we've done that. We've done that homework, here's the results, here's how it will benefit the community, right. and we'll, the community can benefit from that. I think that these are the goals that I'm seeing of, of, of a wonderful project like this and how we can go forward in the site selection process. Great, yeah, they're, they're, they're great suggestions, and I think, um, you know, um, like I said before, the, in, in the, the timing of scheduling this is great because you know we're kind of kicking off, this feels like a good kickoff for a, for a 10 year vision. There's a lot of opportunity still for here, uh, for us to collaborate with you and to receive suggestions like that um, and to obviously continue uh, discussions with our agency partners, both and, at the city level. The last thing I'd ask you is just a, a quick summary of the, of the $100 million breakdown for the funding. Where is, uh, where is that coming? Is it straight through EDC? Is it federal, state, local? Uh, it, in terms of funding for NYC, uh, so the $100 million was allocated via uh, city capital funds, so that is, that is city money. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll certainly, as we move along, look for, uh, you know, state and federal grant opportunities or fu uh, funding opportunities, um, as well as uh, unlock private sector capital um, to, in, in essence, um, you know, create uh, an opportunity for public-private partnerships as we move forward. Well, that, that's always, I think, a bright spot as we look for those partnerships. Do we envision anything with the existing, um, like we mentioned at Staten Island, where there is, whether it's Amazon or any company that that's actually impacting this issue, um, do we, EDC envision a future partnership with other companies to work with this program as they expand into New York City? Yes, absolutely. So uh, one example is uh, working with New York State on developing the uh, rail transit facilities that happens to be on New York State property, but we are working with them on how to best develop these locations. Um, Ooh, I like that. I like bringing New York State down to talk to us about how they're impacting New York City. I think that's a future hearing right off the bat. We were talking about working with the New York State EDC and, and bringing them down on an update on those type of projects. Mm -hmm. um, as well as a uh, site uh, on Staten Island that is actually owned by a railroad company, a private company, uh, but that we'd work, want to work with them um, on how to best uh, perhaps co-develop a site um, as well. Perfect. Anything in closing that you'd like to add before we let you go? Right. Well, to, to your point earlier, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I just want to thank you for having us and, and the fact that there's uh, so many council members who want to speak on this topic. I think we really appreciate the support. And I want to just add, in particular, um, the, the comments that a few of you made about um, a, a need to look and be even more ambitious than we've already been in this plan is great. We know that um, that we have your support and we you know, hope to continue to engage with you as we uh, move forward in this uh, it's a long clear horizon example. strategy. It's a clear example of, of this is just the first step. You know, like we're building on this. This is it's a hearing, but it's things that we need to follow up on because we're talking about the future. And like I said, we're not sure what future council members or mayors or whoever is going to have an impact. We want to make sure the good that we're doing is, is enabled to go forward. And I think the last thing, since I, I wasn't sure of the difference, um, I guess the inland ports. Could you explain the difference between the inland port and an other distribution facility? Because I was just had some questions on. I, I just didn't understand the difference. Sure. Um, inland ports um, uh, are essentially large distribution facilities that are typically located far from a coastline um, or harbor where uh, real estate values tend to be quite high. Uh, we're seeing inland ports uh, crop up outside of places like LA um, or in places like Virginia um, that are connected typically by a rail line. Um, and the, the difference between just a typical warehouse and perhaps an inland port is, is that connection, that direct rail connection between a 
uh, container terminal um, and a warehousing sort of distribution. Do we have an existing one now that we... We don't use? have an existing one uh, in New York City, but it's something that we're certainly looking at as a potential future solution. Um, uh, and so that's something that, you know, wouldn't be right out of the gate like our uh, interventions we talked about today, but it's something that we uh, certainly want to think about um, as we move into the future. Yeah, I think you have limited options of some of the sites we've talked about going forward, so that might need to be incorporated as we talk about those sites before you lose those opportunities. Yes. Um, and I know that the, the huge cost of the existing businesses in New York City through using the trucks to go through interstate traffic uh, is one of the top reasons. A business like my district, Crystal Windows, the largest, smallest employer in the city, uh, their cost of exporting and importing the windows is higher than any other window company in the country because of the cost of commercial traffic going to and from and the tolls and the cost on the trucks. So these type of plans are critical in keeping our future businesses. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of, of my staff, who prepared everything, thank you for that. And I, I'd like to give, uh, we have one panel from the Waterfront Alliance, Karen Imus, to give her a chance to, to come up. She's waited patiently to, to speak. So I think that concludes our testimony with EDC for today. Thank you. Thank you for waiting, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's, it was good. As, as we're saying, this was a good hearing. Yeah, I was just it's fine. It's it's the more we hear about these topics, the the more that we'll have from Karen to discuss them. Around. Good afternoon, Karen. Welcome. Is this on? Oh, good just afternoon. Click that on. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Imus, the senior director of programs at the Waterfront Alliance. Um, thank you for holding this hearing today. As you know, the Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit civic organization and coalition of more than 1,000 community and recreational groups, educational institutions, businesses, and other stakeholders. Our mission is to inspire and enable resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. New York's preeminence as a business capital is a direct consequence of its ports. Preparing for a future of complex supply chain logistics demands that we increase our focus on waterborne cargo. Uh, this has been an underlying goal of the Waterfront Alliance for some time. 90% of the cargo moving through New York City, as was mentioned, is delivered by truck. And Freight NYC is a win for our region in several different ways. Less pollution, improving health, decreasing congestion, and more good paying maritime jobs. Uh, Freight NYC is not only a local issue, but a regional issue with global implications. Uh, we commend the city for looking at how to create a regional barge network to offer alternatives from transporting goods to the Northeast, not just between New York and New Jersey, but also up into New England. We support increased investment to bring our region's maritime assets to a state of good repair and to enhance multimodal freight systems. This is a priority, and we were pleased to see that the Red Hook Container Terminal had its lease renewed recently and will continue to serve as a local shipping hub. And we also look forward to the activation of the sustainable South Brooklyn Marine Terminal very soon. Investment is needed in vital maritime and rail infrastructure, not only in order to create economically competitive barging in our harbor, but in order to ensure that our maritime assets are resilient for a future of climate change and rising sea levels as well. Also of importance to the city's future is dredging to maintain channel depth for the safe navigation of ocean-going vessels and for future potential ferry routes. Through Freight NYC, the city has an opportunity to grow good paying skilled jobs inspiring the next generation of freight industry leaders, maritime and supply education at schools like Urban Assembly Harbor School could be replicated across other educational institutions. While many policy proposals are laid out in detail in Freight NYC, one common element is essential for success and that is political will. If there is a shared vision of an economically significant and resilient maritime industry in the New York and New Jersey region, leaders need to take actions to affirm the commitment to this vision. Ports will succeed not only because of market opportunities, but due to support from and coordination with their local and regional public institutions, governing infrastructure development, project permitting, and trade promotion. Waterfront Alliance engages with maritime stakeholders in an effort to understand what is needed by both public and private stakeholders for success and putting the appropriate policies in place, and we hope to be a continued resource as Freight NYC takes shape. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for always being big supporters of the Waterfront Alliance. 
That's why you mentioned the Harbor School, and I think that's a perfect, I, I was so struck when I first met that school and then the maritime opportunities for the students that the very first middle school in College Point, we teamed up with the Harbor School to yes. expand that, and the kids are so excited. And here's yes. a perfect example of job opportunities through a city program with EDC that can directly impact the future students, the next generation, in a good way. So we thank you for that. Any, anything, Councilmember Chaka, before we close? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I have a couple things, and uh, actually, you just reminded me on the Harbor School. The Harbor Middle School will be coming to Red Hook, which is really exciting. Uh, just a stone's throw away from what should be Brooklyn property, but right now is Manhattan property. And, and uh, I'm going to be leading an effort to, um, to have the Governor's Island secede Manhattan and come to Brooklyn because it's just closer. I uh, hope, Chair, you can support me on that. On that, uh, I think the charter is getting revised right now. Um, but the, 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 I think one thing I just want to pull up that is just really important, and it was in one of the questions that I asked earlier, and I think this is something the Chair talks about a lot in this conversation about multi-agency approaches to how we think about economic development, is that political will on the ground uh, and from our neighborhoods. And so I think the Alliance has done such a good job of organizing the blue space and how do, we, how do we think about bringing in the land-based entities that probably never see themselves because we've just done a hor we have a horrible history in the city of putting the walls and barriers to our water and accessing our water. And organizations like yours and Portside are organizations that, that are on a mission. You're on a mission to really build that political power so when we have those land use issues or there's an ACOM that wants to bring a MTA train station to Red Hook uh, because, you know, they just want to throw something in the air, uh, incredibly disingenuous of them that this is, a, this is driven by real estate and instead bring in that local power to understand what's happening, um, to be part of the conversation. How does the Alliance do that right now and b bridging that gap? Uh, thank you. That's a very, very good question. I think the Alliance has um, historically worked across many different sectors from um, grassroots community organizations and community boards up to designers and engineers and architects and developers um, and trying to find a way to marry the different, uh, co sometimes competing interests, but also interests that can be very collaborative. Um, one example that I think is probably most directly related to your question is um, something that the Waterfront Alliance has worked on recently, which are called the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. The um, acronym is WEDGE, and we have a lot of information on our website about it, but what WEDGE really tries to do is set a matrix for smart um, development on the waterfront. And by smart development, we don't mean just uh, resilient design that architects and designers would deploy, but we also mean uh, what kind of community waterfront access comes out of this development and how has the design been sort of arrived at process-wise. Um, it's a little bit like um, a LEED certification for buildings, but think waterfront, with more of a community a aspect um, kind of built into it. And there are a number of projects across the city that have been certified through this matrix. It's a voluntary program. You don't get like a tax incentive out of it or anything. It's really right now and it's more about good stewardship. And one of the things that we're trying to do with this next is do something called Wedge Neighborhoods, where we take this model to different community boards um, that have waterfront um, in their geography and meet with the chairs or the land use chairs or you know the different appropriate entity and think about are there resolutions within the community board that could be adopted or at least have those community board members informed that these are good stewardship guidelines that when a project comes to ULERP or something in front of them, they know that this is out there and has that developer whomever check these boxes. So it's something we can certainly brief your offices more on. No, I, I think that's a that. great idea because what Council Member Chuck is uh, alluding to is so many of the community board votes are with a stipulation or an amendment from the community concern, which is exactly what you're saying. Yes. And unless there's the good stewardship I type of plan, there's no teeth or way to ensure right. that there is. So um, maybe even in the RFP process, we Absolutely. can incentivize those in the good stewardship plan to have an, 
actual incentive to do this. I think that'd be great. Yeah, and so I'd be happy to first send your offices some information and then perhaps we could set up a meeting and we'll keep you apprised of when we go into your, but both, both of your communities will obviously be part of our Wedge Neighborhood Outreach. Thank you, Karen. That's, that, that was, that's, that's, we'd love that, I think, to, to, to follow up on that. Last question on EDC, um, or how has EDC engaged you in the freight plan? Question mark? Yeah, sure. I think we have a, um, a really, I think, positive, productive working relationship with EDC. I'm relatively new to the Waterfront Alliance, um, but historically, I think we have a, a, a very open door sort of conversation. Um, and a lot of times, I think, because of the Alliance is very much um, a partnership of hundreds of different community groups, we're able to uh, take some of EDCs or the city's proposals and kind of collect what we're hearing and report back. Um, so it's not so much that uh, it, there's like a formal channel by which the Alliance is consulted, but I would say we have a very productive working relationship with the staff at um, EDC and we do uh, inform each other. And I think where there are opportunities sometimes for some sort of task force or working group, the Waterfront Alliance is generally represented in those bodies. Thank you for being here and for doing your work. Thank this you. This is good, wor good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Machaca. And with that, we conclude our hearing today. Thank you, everyone.